So thank you very much to the hosts for the introduction. I am Sui Leung, currently an assistant professor at the Department of Mechanical Engineering in National University, National University of Singapore. So today I'm going to present on the topic using over material creation in metal additive manufacturing. So before I go into the topic proper, let me give a brief introduction of National University of Singapore, or in short, we call it NUS. So NUS is Singapore's flagship university, or uh, it has more than 100 years history. And within the many years, uh, I am uh, teaching and research in the Faculty of Engineering in the Department of Mechanical Engineering. So most of the additive manufacturing activities of the universe consolidated in this NUS Center for Additive Manufacturing, or in short, AM.NUS. It is a multidisciplinary collaboration that taps into expertise across five schools and faculties across the NUS campus. We have the School of Medicine, the Faculty of Science, Faculty of Engineering, Faculty of Dentistry, as well as School of Design and Environment. So as you can see that we work very closely with the Faculty of Medicine and Faculty of Dentistry and the National University, National University Hospital, same cap with the key trust of the center focused mainly on the biomedical applications enabled by additive manufacturing, such as surgical instruments, simulations and processes, restorative repair and implants, AM enabled medicine, oral and cranial facial applications, as well as 3D bioprinting. For a brief introduction of myself, I will start working on additive manufacturing or 3D printing in short that in 2012 with the Sintan and to join lab on additive manufacturing by ASTAR, the government research agency, as well as I was also a PhD candidate back in NTU Additive Manufacturing Center. And I continued my research in the area after I graduated with my PhD at the Center for Print in NTU. So I was in US the Department of Mechanical Engineering to continue my research as an assistant professor. So in the area of 3D print, my research touch on polymer 3D printing, 3D bio printing using hydrogel, mainly the soft material. However, my key focus area is on metals additive manufacturing, focusing biomedical applications such as implants, surgical guide, dental framework, and for other medical applications, as well as for the aerospace and defense application. This gives a good overview of my research objective in metal additive manufacturing, which is really to create a plain um, approach to the additive manufacturing through the use of experiment approach as well as data analytics to further understand the process property and structure relationship in metal additive manufacturing. So in order to push the next frontier in the additive manufacturing, I am focusing on two different approaches, the in-situ alloy approach as well as the multi-metal processing approach. But due to the time constraint in the conference today, I'll be focusing my talk on the work that we have done on in-situ alloying. Why in-situ alloying? If we look at the development of the traditional duty printers that most of us have in our homes or office, you can see that the technological advances throughout the year starts from very simple or low resolution printing such as dot matrix printing, Thermal and then technology improves and develops the resolution of the print improves as well. Then you have your laser printing, your inkjet printing, 
and followed by digital color printing, where you can even print your document in multiple colors that you can see or configure using your computer software. So latest developments like the all-in-one printers, where you can scan your documents and then print it all within one uh, equipment of compare that to additive manufacturing for metal particularly you have oh, we also have decades of development in this technology starting with people using selective sintering a sintering process to create metal products and then finally it goes into full melting where you touch make use of the powder bit fusion technology such as electron beam melting selective laser melting to melt the to melt, fully melt the metallic powders to improve the quality and the properties of the part fabricated. Then, of course, you also have your another side of the metal additive manufacturing technique that is commonly used as well, which is um, directed energy deposition represented by the laser engineered net shaping technology. However, that's the most recent breakthrough that we have in metal additive manufacturing back in the 1990s when such tanks are developed. Of course, there are on improvements to these technologies, to these techniques as better process control or better file input data transfer, etc. So a brief overview of the additive manufacturing that, that we are all familiar with the mod starts a digital design file that you can design using your CAD software like AutoCAD or SolidWorks. And then this CAD software or CAD mod is sliced and then fit into your printing. All material input mostly in the powder form for powder bit fusion or powder or wire form for the directed energy deposition method. Then you can get layer by layer building up to form your final product that can be used in the industry with or without processing depending on the requirement of the part itself. So this give or take on our metal additive manufacturing technique that uses powder as feedstock, your laser powder bit fusion or electron beam powder bit fusion as well as your powder fat directed energy deposition. However, we soon notice the limitations of, of the material used in 3D printing. How do we push it to, to the next uh, level, to the next frontier, right? So current problem with the metal additive manufacturing that most processors use is that it uses pre-alloyed powder, correct? So um, most of the material are established materials like your titanium alloys, your various grade of steels or cobalt chromium alloys, etc. These materials are not um, originally developed for additive manufacturing. So they will have some limitations when they are processed by the additive manufacturing process, which has their own unique um, thermal phenomena during the 3D printing process. So for it, we are, our work proposed the use of in-situ alloy, where we use powder mixture of to do the printing. So there are certain advantages of doing use powder mix. Create design for additive manufacturing and it also allows single step fabrication where you can build the parts while doing the alloy. So we are actually combining dual steps or multiple steps into one equipment. So compare it to the development of your home printer is equivalent to having uh, the cartridges of primary colors, allowing them to mix the different primary colors to form your wider arrays of colors that enable your color printing. So that's the objective we are trying to get with our uh, institute alloying. So institute alloying can address several material limitations in M now. For example, thermal cracking, right? The conventional processes like your machining or your form formative manufacturing process, the 
rapid solidification or the thermal in fact, this rapid solidification or repeating heat um, solidification, remelting and heating and cooling actually causes the some of the materials they are not optimized for additive manufacturing to form cracks during the processing. So one typical example is an aluminum alloy like 6065. No matter how we so-called optimize the process parameters by playing with the lasers parameters, the scanning speed, or the powder parameters like the particle size, morphology. There is no way to fully eliminate this term crack in material. Therefore, most of the time that we will see that, oh, this composition is not suitable for 3D printing. And so Big applications of additive manufacturing is, of course, in the medical industry, right? So we use established materials like stainless steel, cobalt chrome, or even titanium alloys like titanium 6AL4V, which is very popular in the industry to use in plants. This material, right, although they can be fabricated by additive manufacturing techniques. However, they are not uh, suitable or optimal for implants. For example, the mismatch of the modulus between the, the implants and the natural bone implant loosening in the long run. So most patients or 10% of the patients that undergo the replacement surgery actually need to do a revision surgery after their implant loosened within their body. Right. So we are trying to come up with new material to prevent such implant problem. Furthermore, the implant material, most of them are designed for not with uh, implants or biomedical applications in mind. For example, the titanium 6.4, Alloys contain vanadium or aluminium that can result in toxicity in the body, or they have poor wear corrosion and resistance. So by using in situ alloying, it actually allows us opportunity to play with more um, material compositions, thus allowing uh, us to study a new material to create better in one material in the future. So what example that we look at is actually the beta titanium alloys as studies have shown that it allows the modulus of the implants of the material to be closer to natural bone thus reducing the shooting effect as well as beta titanium the beta stabilizer in titanium usually makes use of can make use of non-toxic elements such as tantalum or tin so this gives a good overview of uh, what we are trying to do with in-situ alloying, right? Compared to the traditional method where we use gas atomizer to create the powders with pre-alloyed material, for example, titanium tantalum, they are homogeneous for each of the powder particle. In in-situ alloying, we are using powder blend with the particles having the unique um, compositions of the pure element within each of the particle. This allow us to do what we call rapid alloy design, or if I use an old term, rapid prototyping of material composition, right? So we can do a minute fine tuning of compositions by adding in additional uh, elemental powders, to, and then we can use it for verification of the material property or whether it can be 3D printed rapidly, right? So across the other spectrum, of course, with each composition, then we have to look at how do we optimize the uh, process parameters or the recipe for each of this material. So as I mentioned, we are focusing on bio, uh, beta titanium currently, right? Due to its compatibility, biocompatibility and low modulus. So we are actually focusing on this beta stabilizer 
within titanium to act as the secondary element. So a study we have conducted is on titanium tantalum alloy, where we start with a one-to-one -one ratio, a 50% titanium, 50% tantalum, um, tantalum ratio to process by the powder bit fusion process. So uh, another advantage we can use this powder mixture is especially for refractive alloy such as tantalum that has high melting point right it will be very costly to create the spherical powder from tantalum due to the high melting point that require high higher energy input to fully melt the powder during the atomization process so with mixture right we can actually use a non-spherical secondary material is of lower uh, production cost to produce. And with a spherical element, spherical material that acts as the medium to push the non-spherical part particle during the deposition. So overall, the flowability will still be within the acceptable range for 3D printing while we are decreasing or reducing the overall cost of the powder for this 3D printing process. So like any other uh, trial in terms of new material, we need to get the optimized parameters or the recipe of the, each of the material, right? So uh, we do mainly play around with four key parameters, the laser scanning speed, the hatch pacing, the layer thickness as well as the laser power or what consolidated known as the energy density. So the, for ideal case, it will be to obtain a defect free part that is quantified by the density of the part in comparison to the theoretical density of the material. So some of the defects that can occur during 3D printing can be incomplete melt tracks when there's insufficient energy input into the material or boiling effect that is caused by unstable melt that can be a result of excessive energy that cause turbulence within the melt pool. Right. So we studied this alloy that are fabricated by the powder bit fusion in detail. And we can see that it actually achieved what we wanted to achieve, which is to create beta titanium alloys. So we used the characterization techniques to validate the um, alloy formed by this in-situ alloying approach. And it is proven that it can achieve what we set out to achieve, right? So the beta phase is actually predominantly found in the alloy form, showing that the tantalum actually has the beta stabilizing effects that suppress the formation of the alpha prime phase that you typically form you typically observe in other titanium alloy after the powder bit fusion process. So we also did composition studies because somebody will be questioning if we mix the powders and fabricate them layer by layer, will, be the, will there be segregation of the material across the layers? So the answer is we do get consistent part composition across the samples that we have built. Of course, to make that the performance of the new material is up to par. We benchmark it with, with conventional or established materials that are used in the same applications, such as the titanium 64, titanium, and the pure titanium. Right? So, due to the difference in microstructures, which is uh, obvious right, because of different material properties, right, we, we will then get different mechanical properties for the different materials. So we can see that titanium tantalum set out what we want to achieve, which is to bring the modulus of the implant material closer to the, our natural bone itself. Right. So we have done preliminary study focusing on titanium tantalum in a one-to-one -one ratio. Then the next aim is to really realize the uh, rapid prototyping of the material composition. So as such, we did further study on 
titanium. Titanium with varying composition or amount of tantalum. And using the consistent or the same parameters that we use to produce pure titanium, we actually use the same parameters to produce the different material alloys. So this actually shows that across the different material composition, there is actually needs for repeated rounds of repeated rounds of process optimization to get uh, material properties that are or to get the part performance, the part quality that are optimal for each of the composition. So at the current stage, we are still a few steps away or a distance away from getting what I call the fuck and play approach, right? Where I can do my mixing of the material and then I can do printing immediately. This is because of the restriction that each material will have their own unique process parameters across the different uh, machines or equipment itself. Nonetheless, this shows us a very good example of how um, different compositions affect the material properties as well as the uh, 3D printability of the material itself. So we did in that um, microstructure characterizations of the different compositions. And we do see that with uh, increasing tantalum amount, there are more segregation of unmelted particles that exist. This is because recall that the tantalum uh, melting point is much higher compared to titanium. So if I'm using an energy input that is enough to melt the pure titanium, this energy will not be sufficient to melt the titanium tantalum or the increase in amount of tantalum. Thus resulting is more unmelted particle that exists within the material itself. So of course with different mechanical um with different microstructures, we do get different mechanical properties. And then it's interesting to note that when we set out doing a one is to one ratio, there is other compositions that are much more suitable for our intended applications, such as the titanium 30% tantalum alloys that give you a much lower modulus compared to the titanium 50 tantalum alloys while giving a higher strength as well. So I have previously uh, mentioned something about the segregations of the material, which is the inherent uh, challenge for um, in-situ alloy form, uh, in-situ alloy form alloys, right? So in order to improve the homogeneity of the parts itself, we are looking at we are looking at using novel scanning strategy to solve what we call the porosity segregation dilemma. So why is this a dilemma? Because I want to have increasing energy density to melt more of the, for example, the tantalum particle of the or the element with a higher melting point, right? But with increasing energy density, it actually results in more keyhole porosity due to the increased instability of the melt pool. Then on the flip side, if I decrease the energy density, I will get more unmelted particles, but lesser keyhole porosity. So we will need to balance this dilemma in order to achieve a good property of the parts that uses in-situ alloying approach. So we look into using different laser profile, right? The Gaussian beam profile, which is what most um, powder bit fusion, laser powder bit fusion system use, and replace it with a top head profile. We also look into different scan type and scanning strategy. So this slide shows a good overview of the different effect of effect of different laser profiles that we get during the powder bit fusion process. Yeah. So if you observe from the simulation video, you can see that using the similar scanning speed and laser power, the top head profile laser actually gets us a much larger melt pool that is substantial 
propagated or sustained over a longer period of time. This is um, desirable for in-situ alloying because a larger melt pool and a longer period of sustained melt pool actually allows better diffusion of the elements within the melt pool. So this actually improves the homogeneity of the institute part form. Okay. So this gives a good uh, overview of the difference between the melt pool form during the with different laser profiles. Okay. So in the future, as I mentioned, that we look at um we look at how different set of parameters is needed for every single uh, compositions of the material form, right? So we are still quite a distance away from doing really automated or plug and play uh, powder mixing for additive manufacturing. So in the future, we are looking at using um, modeling that are complemented with uh, experiment technique to create what we call a control or a digital twin for the in-situ alloying approach. So in the future, this digital will be able to predict the outcome of every single uh, compositions of the material and then outcome the recipe or the process parameters for the composition without any needs for the experimental uh, optimization process. So thus, in the future, with such digital twin or what we call the expert system, you will be able to really get us to a plug and play approach for in-situ alloying. So this give a good overview of what we have done for in-situ alloying. So we now start with binary alloys with titanium and tantalum. So in the future, we also have the potential to look at high entropy alloys high temperature alloys or even composite structures that use nanoparticle as reinforcement. And in recent article, there has also been people using it to create what they call heterogeneous alloys that have very unique microstructures within controlled region of the 3D printed parts. This is a unique opportunity, opportunity because out of so many manufacturing process or material processing techniques, 3D printing has the unique capability to really do very localized control in terms of material compositions as well as microstructures. So this heterogeneous alloys actually allows us to improve mechanical strength and ductility simultaneously. Get the plug and play approach, then we will be getting are uh, aiming to get better predictability of the process outcome as well, right? Through the use of um, digital twin machine learning and artificial intelligence. And of course, the alloy forms have wide arrays of potential applications. We have looked mainly into biomedical, but the knowledge gained from such experiments can also be applicable to aluminum alloys, copper, chromium alloys, copper alloys or any other alloys that are difficult to form by additive manufacturing for aerospace in the marine and offshore applications. So these are some of the publications that we have worked on for in-situ alloying. So feel free to go and take a look if you are interested. And with that, I would like to end my presentation for further discussion or questions or collaborations. You can contact me via my email stated here in this slide. So with that, I open up the floor for questions and thank you very much. I do not have the exact numbers for how long an implant lasts, but uh, from what I read, right, on average, um, the implants can last a maximum of five to 10 years, while the best optimal results they have is up to 10 years. So imagine as uh, people get more active, right? Um, the demand for implants will actually increase as there are more, uh, let's say, injuries, right? And the uh, patients do have a general trend of getting younger and living longer, right? So 
the time spent for implants actually increases. So that's why we are looking at um, doing innovations in material to aim for uh, long lasting implants that can extend the uh, lifespan of the implant itself. So 3D printing um, actually has the opportunities to create new material that people previously have not uh, thought of because of the restrictions of the material processing technique. Right? So with new material then, hopefully the performance of the implants will improve so that uh, they will reduce the need for revision surgery in the future. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you, doctor. Thank you, Dr. Leong, for that presentation. And now we award this certificate of appreciation. The certificate of appreciation is awarded to Dr. Sing Sui Leong for imparting valuable knowledge as a resource speaker during the ASEAN Conference on Additive Manufacturing 2021 with the theme 3D Printing, Revolutionizing the Manufacturing Industry, held on October 28 to 29, 2021. Given this 29th day of October 2021 at the Ducit Thani Hotel, Makati City, Philippines. To be signed by Engineer Marianito T. Margarito, the Conference Chairman of ACAM 2021, and Dr. Annabel V. Briones, the Director of the Industrial Technology Development Institute. Thank you very much.